Good morning. Um, welcome to the HBK Electroacoustics Conference. Uh, coming to you here from uh, Los Angeles, California. My name is Mark Serridge, and today I will be talking about um, testing vinyl record players, um, which um, sounds easy. Um, it really is not. So in this age of fast, convenient, cheap digital downloads, the resurgence of vinyl as the medium of choice for music lovers is quite remarkable. In 2021, vinyl records outsold CDs for the first time in decades, whereas compact disc sales rose 1% in 2021 from 40.1 to 40.6 million, vinyl record sales rose 51% to 41.7 million, and turntable sales rose accordingly to 82 million units. However, unlike digital playback systems, it isn't easy to test the frequency response and distortion of the mechanical pickup cartridge, which arguably is the most critical component in determining the sound quality of any turntable. In this paper, the author, myself, in fact, gets to test a turntable pickup system using three very old open loop techniques, the test record. Three different records from three different manufacturers and three different eras are used. And thank you to Adele for um, putting uh, out her last album on vinyl, uh, hugely successful. In fact, the rate of vinyl sales last year, as we said, rose a massive 51%. And 38% um, of all album sales in the country last year were in vinyl format. I'm sure many of you here uh, are way too young to remember the days when 71% um, uh, of, of the market, of $12 billion of sales of, were in vinyl records, even in the mid 70s. Uh, even as the 80s arrived and cassettes became popular, there were $11 billion worth of cassettes being sold. I don't think you can even buy a cassette anymore. Uh, then the CDs came around, the uh, early 90s began to uh, take over. Uh, in the mid 2015s, digital downloads basically became um, popular and um, streaming um, became the thing, um, $12 billion worth of streaming revenue in the year 2020. So if you're gonna be recording more and more um, um, content on, on vinyl, um, that means we gotta have more turntables and the sale of brand new turntables, little boutique designs from small companies through to the larger usual players like Sony, just taking off massive uh, growth in the sale uh, of turntables. So the heart of every turntable system is a cartridge, magnetic cartridge, moving coil, moving magnet, doesn't matter too much. Same principle here, where you have a magnet, in this case, the moving magnet, the magnet is moving uh, within a coil and generating an electrical output. Um, so it's all about the velocity uh, proportional to the output. Uh, true of the input voltage to the cutter. Remember, records are made using, by cutting vinyl, also essentially using a velocity pickup. The principle being that velocity is king and the voltage out from this system here is the field strength times the length of the coil times the speed at which the coil is moving. This creates all the problems that we're going to find when it comes to actually testing a record. So at last year's conference, I tried to compare the frequency response and distortion of a record player versus a CD player and a Bluetooth streaming device. And a quick and dirty subjective test I performed here during the pandemic showed that most, most people in my very small test actually preferred the sound of vinyl. But the, sound, the, the vinyl turned out to have the worst uh, measurement results that uh, I found. And then we get to discuss here the RIA filter, uh, uh, which is applied or not applied to these records that made the results look uh, worse than they actually were. So I promised to repeat last year's measurements on vinyl with other test records. So unlike testing other electroacoustic uh, devices such as loudspeakers, microphones, um, audio systems, amplifiers, you know, CD players, etc. You're, you're in a closed loop environment where the 
you have some sort of audio analyzer which is sending out some sort of signal to a device and its response is coordinated somehow with what's being sent out. So we know what we're sending out, we know what we're getting back, and we can perform some um, in-depth, uh, clever analysis on all the parameters we might be interested in, frequency response distortion. However, when it comes to turntables, we don't have that luxury. All we have is some device under test, i.e. the pickup cartridge, sending out a signal from, in this case, a test record that we didn't make the signal, we have no control over that signal. All we're doing is measuring an open loop response. That makes life a little, little interesting. So for those of you who did not see last year's presentation, uh, I picked um, these, these units here for testing because I happen to have them because I listen to them all the time at home. The Thorin's TD321 from about 1988, the Rega pickup cartridge arm, 1988, approximately the same, with a brand new Autophon Red moving magnet cartridge, which I highly recommend, by the way, it, it sounds great. And this Bellari Phono preamplifier, which actually contains the RIA filters that caused us some uh, misunderstanding last time. So this is my test setup, uh, similar to last time. The pickup cartridge um, goes through the phono preamplifier, uh, out comes a, uh, a line level voltage, which I plug into two channels of a Lanx I data acquisition unit uh, from B and K. That is connected to uh, the, the laptop uh, running our software, which is called BK Connect. So those of you who might have come to the presentation last year would have seen me using this, this Autophon test record. So real quick, what is a test record? It is a record with a whole range of signals recorded onto the record as if it was music, essentially. You cut a record with test tones, uh, sweeps, you leave blank tracks, you can measure wound flutter, all the, all the stuff that you'd be interested in. There are signals on these records that you play back and then you measure the output of the cartridge. I had access to two of the three B and K test records that uh, the company uh, I still work for uh, released. I think these were in the 70s. Um, and even a popular science uh, test record. Um, the B and K ones, you notice, are running at, be careful with the speed. This one runs at 45 RPM, this one at 33. If you get that wrong, your results gonna look strange. But the very first thing that I did was to record all the individual tracks into BK Connect. So these are all the tracks you can probably see as a one kilohertz tone, there's a sweep, um, there's a quiet groove. Um, you just name the tracks according to what you read off the label. So you get all the cracks and the buzzes and, and, and the dust in between the tracks, but you get them all, and that, then you don't have to really go back and uh, play with the record player anymore. You can also listen to them, which is a powerful thing. Um, you just click and have a listen. Oh, yeah, that really is a sign sweep. It's coming down, or this sign sweep is, is, is going up in frequency. Very powerful, simple. One of the hard parts of doing analysis of these test records is you get everything you want and everything you don't want in your recording. So you'll get noise before the signals begin, you get noise afterwards, you get crackles, you get um, all sorts of artifacts. At least it's good to be able to just edit out the sections that you want to analyze. You're not gonna analyze the entire section, but because it's open loop, there's no synchronization here between which part of the signal goes through the analysis. You have to select all that manually. Once I've selected my signals um, and sections of my recordings that I'd like to analyze, I basically bring them all in over here on the left. I build myself a, uh, a what we call a process chain. Here's a uh, 24th octave analyzer um, doing a maximum hold, exponentially averaged. Um, so the, the, the sweeps and everything are gonna go through that. They're gonna go through the overall level 
unfiltered level, just the absolute overall level versus time. And I'm also going to do an FFT versus time. So this is my very first uh, measurement um, where I've got my um, level versus time. And you can see it does start to drop down just like it did last time, last year. And the moment it starts to drop down is, funny enough, the magic one kilohertz number. And this is SST versus time. So this is my first uh, insight into looking at the, uh, the test record. Now this is very hard to see because it's of the scale, but there's a big drop um, at one kilohertz starting to kick in. This is from the log, uh, the log sweep from the B&K test record. We saw this last year with the Odafon test record, and we um, needed to do more investigation, which is why we're doing this again with uh, the, with the other test records. Same same effect. Yeah, so this is last year's um, we could, uh, uh, response using the Autophon test record. And you can even see in the, in the time signal how the level is dropping off and that corresponds with a one kilohertz, so reaching one kilohertz and then, and then decaying. I repeated the measurements with the Autophon uh, record this time. It's a sweep down. The others were a, a sweep up. Uh, didn't change anything. Um, nice smooth roll off over 1k, and that's what that looks like. The B and K uh, test record indicated that the above 1 kilohertz in the sweep, the record uh, was cut with a constant velocity. Well, constant velocity um, isn't going to help me when I'm running that output through my RIA filter. So what you're really seeing here is the fact that the RIA filter in, in the uh, in the preamplifier is attenuating that output. It's not the cartridge itself. It is, it is the RIA filter. Um, I can change that by applying some of my own filtering within the measurement, and I can see I can win back my high frequency performance. So just to recap here what, what's going on, um, Last year, we ran into this where the test record was supposed to have the, the pre-emphasis uh, as shown in the blue curve. So a reduction in the base applied to the cutting tool and an emphasis of the high frequency. Um, and when that is played back through a RIA, Recording Industry of Association of America, compliant um, filter, it flattens everything out. You win back your base and you reduce your treble. You should end up with a flat frequency response. It's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, I got this slide from uh, my colleague, Jim Weir. Uh, this is a study he, he came up with. Someone's done a spectrum analysis of uh, the, the frequency content of, of basically popular music. And it's, it's interesting how the frequency content of, of modern music is all about the bass um, and the really and the, the, the roll off the content really is starting to roll off above one kilohertz so it's less critical to have good performance over one kilohertz that's just a coincidence I believe I also would like to thank uh, Jim Weir for uh, pointing me in the direction of this incredibly interesting article. I think it's from 2009 in Stereophile magazine on the battle essentially within the record industry since the 1950s to come to an agreement on uh, what kind of uh, emphasis or pre-emphasis should be applied to the cutting tool when you, when you make a vinyl. You have to do something about it because you cannot let the bass occupy more space than say five kilohertz. You would run out of space quickly on the record. So you have to you know, minimize the, the, the excursion caused by bass, emphasize the treble to get better signal to noise ratio, and then fix it later, as they say these days, fix it in the mix through your, through your preamp. But the article is, is actually fascinating because it shows that there has been a, a conversation going on for a long, long time on 
you know, the limit, essentially the limitations of using a velocity transducer, both to cut a disc and to uh, play back that cut. So I dug deep in my in my collection. Uh, I was looking for information on the test records I'd been using, and I discovered that back in in I think in the 70s, uh, B and K was producing this box, which actually had the ability to to add the equivalent of the filters we're talking about here to compensate for the the preemphasis that could be applied to a test record or not a test record. The entire thing done in an analog sense, but you just basically decide what kind of filtering I would like to apply, and then you would feed the output of that into your, for example, your chart, your chart recorder to get a frequency response curve, with or without the preemphasis. And the amazing thing back then was that these uh, these cuts on the on these records here were able to communicate. Um, and control the uh, the record, the paper position on the level recorder, which is, is quite fantastic, um, which we cannot even do right now using um, the system I showed you earlier. So in many ways, uh, this was still an open loop uh, technique, but more a little bit of closed loop um, intelligence built into how the records had certain tones on them that could cue the level recorder to be in a certain position at a certain time. So what I hope I've been able to show you here in conclusion is that it is possible to, to take a, a test record and make measurements, um, but you have to take care. It's actually not very, not very straightforward. Um, you got to understand which, uh, which type of EQ is on the record. You know, the pre-emphasis we talked about, the RIA filter being one, uh, the constant velocity above one kilohertz being on the B and K test record. You, if you get that wrong, if you don't understand that and include it in your analysis, your, your frequency responses do not look correct. Um, once you understand the, the nature of the preemphasis on the records, then you have to work with uh, some EQ filters in your analysis. Um, that could all be digital at this stage. Um, so you can make meaningful tests and get the correct results. Uh, I'd like to talk to manufacturers to see how they test. I, I, I really do hope that they are testing, uh, even though I think this industry is characterized by subjectivity to a large degree. This turntable just sounds great. It's much better than that one. Um, it's, it's, it's warm and fuzzy, but there is some science behind this. Um, and, you know, what are the manufacturers of turntables, and there are so many more than there ever used to be, small boutique manufacturers. What are they doing to test um, the, their performance these days? Um, you've got to understand also the, as I say, the audiophile mindset. Um, who are the people who buy record players? Well, I'm one of them. <laughs> but it, at the end of the day, is our world of test and measurement uh, a friend or a foe to these manufacturers? And finally, in my epilogue, I've just finished reading this book uh, written by Ken Scott. Uh, Ken Scott was the um, an engineer on, on most many, many of the seminal albums of, of the last 50, 50 years, including many of the Beatles albums, went on to work and record. He began his life um, in uh, what was EMI Studios at the time, it later became Abbey Road Studios. Um, and his first job was to catalog uh, recordings. And then he got his promotion. Uh, Ken got promoted from being the guy writing down what tracks were on which tapes to being the guy actually cutting uh, test vinyl, test presses. And there's a whole section in this book early on about uh, the, the, the tricks that they would play with the uh, essentially pre-emphasis on the cutting tool, which um, you know gave them a, a sound that they liked and they really didn't care too much about the science of it. They just knew that they had the power when cutting a record to give it a certain sound that would make people like that record um, even even more. So if any of you um, get the chance, check out this great book, uh, Abbey Road to Ziggy Stardust by Mr. Ken Scott. Thank you for your time.